so good morning and a warm welcome to everyone who is here in person and also to everyone online to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Christina Anastasi and I am going to be your chair today. Now, before we begin, on behalf of Geoscience Australia, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Today's seminar is going to be presented to you by three people, Keith Sircone, Margaret Sweeney and Tia Penny. Their presentations will be about the intersection of fieldwork and community outreach. It's going to focus on the lessons learned from design and deployment of a mobile laboratory and associated outreach ex ex exhibits. Now, as part of Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program, Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project, of which they are a part, have a mobile laboratory that was designed and built to help with field work and to enhance opportunistic outreach experiences for communities in the areas where field work is taking place. Outreach not only promotes the field work program, but also the work an agency does more broadly and can help scientists to better understand the general community who are the consumers of the data. This in turn can help with future planning of field and other work programs. Now this seminar today will explore some of the lessons learned from the outreach programs that were planned and evaluated throughout 2023. The presenters will describe how stakeholder engagement can be improved by well-researched and designed models and engagement exhibits. Now before I hand over to our speakers, I'll give you a quick overview. Now, Dr. Keith Sircone, he is our Director of Geoscience Australia's Laboratory with a geology background across New Zealand, Canada and Australia. His commitment to community engagement and its importance for the future of earth science was a driving force in his leadership of the development of the mobile laboratory. Dr. Margie Sweeney, she is the manager of our access and engagement team. She too has a geology background as well as a science teaching background and which she has used across Australia and Africa. As a leader in the Exploring for the Future Program's Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project, she has shared her passion about communicating science to communities through developing tools for geoscientists to use when engaging with people. And our third speaker is Tia Penny. Like Keith and Margie, Tia is also a geologist and she is also a science communicator. Her commitment to fostering connections between science and society have underpinned her work as a member of the Access and Engagement Team and as a member of the Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project. Tia has recently also started a new role as a project officer for South Pan. Now, please welcome our speakers to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Canberra. Good morning, everyone who's uh, online around the country. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and as part of acknowledgements, I also want to acknowledge that the, what we'll be talking about today has been a way bigger effort than just the three of us. Um, it has involved people from across uh, Geoscience Australia, um, good colleagues at Questacon as well. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Christina, who is the uh, sponsor for the Geoscience Knowledge Sharing Project and uh, very valuable top cover support <laughs> for, for this project, which you'll learn is uh, something a bit different for Geoscience Australia. So we really appreciate Christina being a believer from day one and, and providing that uh, great support. Um, and as I said, there's a long list of people there as well. We probably haven't covered everyone, but uh, I would hope you know who you are and that you know, every little contribution made a big impact on this project. So where did it all begin? <laughs> um, back in 2016, in the first phase of the Exploring for the Future program, uh, an idea emerged that around some of the uh, some of the projects that were a part of that first phase, particularly uh, a big geochemical sampling program across northern Australia, uh, about processing the samples more locally. So rather than 
uh, the logistic logistics of bringing everything back to Canberra is like, well, can we process some of these things uh, locally? And, and then particularly then that evolved into uh, conversations about, well, can we bring in a, a training element as well uh, for local um, local residents? And uh, so for, out of that concept, the idea of doing soil sampling, sample processing at Alice Springs happened. And then later in, in the first phase of the program, there was also uh, processing for sonic core drilling um, up in Kananara. So it was, those were sort of the, the embryo, embryonic ideas for when the second phase of the, of the Exploring for the Future program came around was like, well, wouldn't it be great if we could do similar things, depending on you know, what projects and things are happening, but you know, having some support that we can get uh, that equipment <coughs> into the field we can set up um, to do that sort of work. So that was the field work part of it. Uh, and then, then as the second phase evolved, and in particular the geoscience um, knowledge sharing project came into being as well, it was like, you know, is there an opportunity to marry that with uh, some outreach? Is that if you're in the community, if you're having that engagement already, um, why not be deliberate about it? Why not um, actually design things to support that outreach? Uh, and that's where the sort of dual role of the mobile laboratory um, came into being. And, and then in discussions as well, again, lots of people involved in this, uh, was these sort of guiding principles that whatever it was, you know, it needed to be as flexible as possible because we didn't know necessarily what sort of projects it might need. Um, it had to be modular so it could fit and adapt for various projects. Uh, it had to be fairly autonomous so it wasn't dependent on, on um, too much infrastructure. Uh, in potentially re uh, regional and remote locations. Um, and it had to be fairly deployable. It had to be sort of a minimum level of um, uh, a barrier to, to that deployment. What we'll be talking about today is actually largely about the outreach stuff, but I did quickly want to talk about the fieldwork side of things, just to say that you know this, is, this was a big component of the mobile lab laboratory and still work in progress. Um, and uh, when we were putting this talk together, it became clear that you know there's a lot to talk about in terms of the field work, portable uh, instruments and things like that, that it, it essentially warrants its own talk down the track to talk about uh, some things about how they work, what the physics and chemistry is behind some of them is really cool and interesting science, uh, but also elements of great quality control and things as well. Um, so is, this is a case of a bit of a placeholder to say, watch this space. Um, and it's not to say that the, the field work side of things has been forgotten. Uh, you, can, you can see there um, on, the, on your right is a, a picture of me uh, demonstrating the, the laser gun uh, to Andrew Heap, our, our chief of division. Um, so, as I said, it's not forgotten because um, yeah, you know, there's a 10 year old boy inside me who's really pleased about the life choices that I've made that led to me using a laser gun on a, on a, on a regular basis. So, before I talk a bit more about the actual design of the trailer, um, I just sort of wanted to give a bit of a a uh, strategic overview of, of where all of this fits in, you know, why the outreach side of things is important. Um, many of you will be familiar with this uh, model, um, this is impact model, impact pathway. Idea being is, you know, on the left, on your left, the, uh, you know, we do science, we collect data, we process data. Uh, through that, we make outputs. Uh, we, you know, deliver those uh, across government, industry, and the communities. They use that for their decision making great things happen, you know, it's obvious, isn't it? Um, but thinking a bit more about this model, and it's a good model, but I think what, what we're seeing emerging with projects like the geoscience knowledge sharing, uh, strategic basins, uh, and the TIGI um, uh, projects that are also happening is sort of building on this one, is recognizing is that that's actually a fundamental gap in that impact pathway, is the gap between what we deliver and how people pick it up. And you know, there's a lot to think about in terms of are they even aware that that thing exists? Do they have access both in the logistic sense, but also in the capability sense? And fundamentally, do they trust it? Do they trust that we're delivering something that's going to help them? So I think that's where outreach comes in, is that by being out there in the community, by promoting our products and our role, um, and also promoting on the side um, that sort of STEM education and awareness as well. We're helping bridge that gap and helping make people aware of what, what, what there is available. And then if we're doing it right, we're also listening and we're actually getting feedback from people about, well, actually what I really need is 
this, or what would help this problem is this data set, do you have that? Um, and so there's both the short term in the sense it helps us do our work in, you know, by engaging with the community, um, helping them understand our land access requirements as well. But then in the long term, we'd hope that also by feeding those requirements back into our planning, right at the start of that cycle, uh, we can actually make, make it into a loop rather than a, a linear process. And then ultimately as well, as the field work side of things, um, again, you know, by making that more effective and more efficient, uh, also helps that whole process of, um, through that loop as well. So hopefully it becomes a big virtuous cycle. So onto the trailer itself, uh, to the mobile lab. So early on, you know, we explored some design ideas. Uh, one earlier idea was to sort of follow what others had done in terms of what they called a mobile laboratory, which is sort of have a, a basically a fitted out shipping container. Uh, we did look at that and decided, well, it's not particularly mobile. It's great if you're going to be in a fixed place for several months at a time, um, but it also needs specialist equipment to move around. So yes, if you're going to be in a remote area, it might not be so good. Um, for a hot minute, we got very excited about the, the, the truck idea. <laughs> Again, there's, you know, there's part of me that's a little reluctant that, that we had to let that one go, um, but it, was, it would effectively used up the whole budget, so yeah. Um, and it, it also would have required specialist driving and training and license. <laughs> Christina says next time, cool. <laughs> um, so then uh, the idea of some sort of you know, large trailer, sort of uh, horse float type thing came along. Um, so some of the early models you can see were <laughs> designed in Lego. <laughs> just to sort of get an idea of how it might look if we were at, you know, like at a regional show or something like that, you know, how much space would we need. Um, so, you know, that was a sort of a great way of doing a, a 3D, quick, quick 3D model of what the space might look at. And yes, as I said, at one point I even worked out what the ratios were so we could get the dimensions right. Um, but then, yes, we came down to the idea with the trailer um, and uh, in particularly working with our field ops team, who I'll give a big shout out to, are awesome with all of this. Um, you know, uh, their, their input into what was needed and their ideas as well. I know things like um, awnings for shade, um, and particularly things like, simple things like, um, and which might not be obvious, is the trailer's a little unusual. It has a tailgate, lifting tailgate to load and unload things. And you might think, well, okay, yes, why not, why not just have a ramp? Because the trailer is designed to go off road, it means its clearance is a little bit higher, and there are Australian standards about the maximum gradient on a ramp. So these are the sort of details we got into, and worked out that in order to have a ramp, the ramp would have had to be about seven metres long <laughs> to meet to meet Australian standards, um, which is effectively longer than the trailer itself. <laughs> so, um, so hence the tailgate, um, and that's worked out really well, actually. Um, it means we've, we've got very adept at being able to unload and load the, uh, the trailer very quickly. So here's some snapshots of what it looks like you know, in the, in, along the way as it was put together um, and as, as the FOES team helped fit it out. And you can see on the right some of the uh, sort of the ideas of modularity is that you know, things can be fitted and moved around. Um, and importantly, uh, you can see there's a fridge. Um, basically, the two, two items in the trailer that have drawn most attention is the fridge and the air conditioning. <laughs> uh, never mind all the, all the you know, blazer guns or anything like that. The things people focus on are yeah, cold drinks and a nice cool place to, to um, uh, relax. And while all that was happening, uh, we, a lot of it was happening in design as well. And again, a big shout out to our design team um, for their vision and assistance with all of this. So things like uh, the banners, uh, um, to put out on display, um, we had a large, got a large screen television, which uh, is actually heading off to Parliament House today to be part of an outreach event there as well. So you know these things can they don't have to move around as a big lump; they can actually move independently, which has been great. Um, so no, there was a lot of things um, coming together all, all through that time, and then eventually, yes, we got to the first deployment at the Canberra Show in February last year, so just over a year ago, um, we got it all up and running, and that was the first you know, time it was all set out, um, marquees, banners, and um, science displays. And then also, uh, more recently in October last year, we then took the trailer and all those displays to Mildura, so you know, we could try, try, getting, try to see what feedback we got when we went to a regional um, setting as well. 
So at that point, I'll hand over to Marky. Thank you. So um, as Keith has already pointed out, um, there's a lot of features of the mobile lab that make it an excellent, effective um, base for outreach. Um, features such as the fridge, the power, air conditioning, and of course, the ability to move large chunks or large exhibits from place to place. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is how we designed the other parts of the outreach exhibit, the, the little pods that you can see around the room and um, some of the hands-on activities that we, we, you know, we took as part of the other components of the outreach exhibit. So I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent to start with and talk a little bit about um, how we incorporated some behavioural science into our thinking and our, and our approach when it comes to exhibition design. And also to help us, because having things is great, but we don't want people just to talk at people. Um, you can watch, you know, members of the public eyes glaze over and you go, I'm going to tell you all about the wonderful things that we do at GA. You really need the decision for them to come into to our exhibition space to be their decision. And so we've used a little bit of behavioural science to, to help us to build our exhibition. All right. So... How do we get people in? So there's a couple of uh, behavioural science concepts we've used to, uh, to help us encourage people to come into our space. The first one is nudge theory. So the nudge theory is a behavioural science concept where people's decisions and behaviours can be influenced in quite predictable ways in just small changes in how you present those choices. And it could be the things that you have available to them to interact with or where you place things in an environment. Um, and the second uh, thing that we wanted to bring into our exhibition is gamification. Um, gamification is to make things as fun as possible. I mean, Christina today was saying how much she enjoyed playing with our little model trucks and in, in um, you know, when she, people come into her office to, to play with these things. And it's a way of engaging people and to help guide them into to learn more about earth science. Um, Kirsten, I'm not going to say her last name right, but Kirsten, um, who is a, a thought leader in this space, is actually going to be doing a seminar here in a few weeks' time. So I highly encourage people to come and, and um, listen to that seminar. I don't think it's going to be about the nudge theory or gamification, or well, it could be, but she's, she's certainly a, um, an excellent um, behavioural scientist and we've got a lot to learn from her. So um, the idea of our nudging behaviour was to encourage people into the space that we've designed and, and eventually, hopefully, you know, encourage people to come and talk about the, the work that we do and the data that we have that might align with their interests. So um, to walk you through the design process for the exhibits... Firstly, we came up with what the key concepts were that we wanted community members to uncover as they come into our exhibition. These all revolved around the main theme of what is under the ground. Um, mineral, energy and groundwater sciences all involve mapping what's under the ground and a lot of the other work that we do in GA as well. Um, so fortunately for us at the moment, there's a lot of pop cultural references to, to you know, stuff going on under the ground, um, Minecraft, uh, Roblox, um, uh, there's another one, uh, Bloxburg, I think. They're all building stuff underneath the ground. These are computer games that a lot of the, and I'm going to say kids, but a lot of adults are into it too. Um, and shows like Stranger Things where, you know, the upside down world, it's all about under the ground. So it's not really a big ask inviting members, members of the public to come in and think more about what is under the ground. And those of you who are in the room, I'll invite you to, to have a look later at some of our, the results from some of our ex exhibitions where we've asked kids and adults to, to you know, what do you think is under the ground to try and inspire just a little spark of interest. So the first six of our exhibits that we just designed, we had to, we had to build from scratch. But to, if we wanted to lead people down this path, suck them into our ex exhibition space, to, um, we actually have a lot of material already um, to describe how geoscientists map underground. And um, we have the big TV that um, 
Keith already told you about, um, which is a great way to, to actually put our um, data out there and make it accessible to the public. So these two I just want to touch on briefly before I talk about how we created the first six exhibits. So the engagement tools that we have. Um, having real life survey equipment out on display um, is a really good way to suck people in to, to learn more about, about the work that we do. So we have a seismometer that we have set up thanks to the FOES team who got the gear all together for us and, and let us take it out into outreach exhibits. Having nodes from reflection seismic lines and showing them what they actually look like is very helpful. Um, we also can't exactly take a vibra size truck, you know, they're quite big. So we do have a 3D printer and the FOES team again helped us to design and uh, a whole series of, of little models that we can actually give to people and leave with people. We just print them out um, and, and can, you know, we've got a drill rig over there as well. So these are things that we've developed. We've also got a helicopter um, for airborne surveys so we can, we can talk about that sort of thing as well. Um, and then, of course, the education team have a lot of material that we can use, like the, the plate tectonic puzzle and globes and things that they've found to be success over their many years of experience. So these are the things we didn't have to design and create. So designing the other six elements, we um, first sat down and worked out, well, you know, what questions do we want to answer? First of all, how do we get people in? Once they're in our exhibition space, how do we keep them there? And then last of all, what, do, what are the key concepts we want them to learn? Now, we thought these were the questions we needed to answer. And then we went over to Questacon, who we have a collaborative partnership with. And boy, did they introduce a whole bunch of other questions that we needed to consider. Um, first one I want to talk about is emotions. What emotion do we, do we want people to leave with? Um, so we had a lot of more research and planning to do with our um, design process. So the emotion one is actually, we, the team kind of came to the same conclusion around about the same time. And what we wanted people to leave with was a sense of awe. Um, and I mean A-W-E, not O-R-E. Um, when you're talking about something like the OSRA passive seismic program and the way we're imaging hundreds of kilometres underneath the ground, it's quite easy to, to be inspired by such a cool project. So that was something we wanted to, people to leave with. But also, the way that we engage with people, it needs to be friendly and open and attentive and listening. Because if they learn nothing at all from any of our exhibitions, at least they'll go, oh, those, you know, those people from Geoscience Australia, uh, they were all OK. They, you know, they were all right people. And they'll have that positive feeling when, when we have to engage with them sometime in the future. Um, so the next stage was getting plans onto paper. And we did some nice scribbled drawings. Um, we need to work out how each exhibit would be interactive. We were going to gamify everything, what components moved and what problems that might bring up. Because as soon as you add complexity into a model, the more likely it is to break. Um, what materials we're going to use that were durable to travel but not cut your fingers. Um, all of these things we had to think about. And one of the big takeaways from the exhibit planning, because we were working iteratively with Questacon, um, was the text. The panels that have text on it, apparently people will only, you know, focus for about 20 seconds. And to try and get our, you know, we thought we were pretty good at, at translating technical information into non-technical language. Turns out we had, a, we had so many different goes at this and had to do it over and over again to, to condense it down and really work out what needed to go in words and what could be presented better as a picture and things like that. And then finally, what open questions do we want people to leave with? Because we don't want them to get everything they can out of that exhibit and then walk away and forget us. We want to inspire some, some um, curiosity. What open-ended questions do we want them to leave with that might encourage them to come and ask? Because then we can talk more about the data and things like that. So we gave our designs over to Rachel at Questacon, who turned our very scribbly drawings into uh, beautiful diagrams that the engineers could actually interpret. And um, here's some of our education team that went out and um, spoke to Questacon in their workshops and the engineers built our beautiful displays that look like this. Um, so we continue to make improvements on all of these displays. Some of them, like the groundwater one, we've had a few issues with, like I said, moving parts and liquids. Turns out liquids are a tricky thing to have a, in an outreach exhibit. 
Um, so we're still learning and we're still getting evaluations and feedbacks on this process. So how do we go? The first lesson we learnt was that there are some displays that draw people in straight away. And it's not exactly the ones that you might think. Like we, we had our types of rock uh, display that we thought was going to be second or third in our line of, you know, drawing people into our exhibition. But it turns out that the magnifier on it kind of looks a bit alien and people don't know what it is. And just that confusion is enough to bring them in to go, what is this? And then there's a cool fossil uh, fish next to it. And, and so this was um, very, very early on, we realised that this is the one that had to be out the front to, to bring people in. Um, and there is not a linear path. It's not like people went from exhibit to exhibit, kind of how we thought they might. Um, we had kids come back multiple times and, um, and never progressed past the size of seismic activity. I don't know if you can see our very smashed up hammer, but this is one of three that, you know, really got a workout because the seismometer was actually so popular. Um, there was people who came straight to the portal, bypassed all our exhibits, with burning questions. And a, a good example of that was a couple um, of doomsday preppers who came in and said to us, you guys would know where all the tunnels are, right? <laughs> so when you design your, you know, map of where all the mines are, including, you know, historic mines and stuff, you don't think that they get that there's the people who are going to be making decisions based on that data. Like, you just don't know who those people are. And it turns out that, you know, the zombie apocalypse coming up in the future, there'll be some people who'll be better off because of our data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, a key takeaway was just how often the parents would come and chat to us if their kids were engaged in doing some, you know, hands-on activities. And, and really, they're the ones that we, we want. Like, obviously, we're trying to encourage children to take up careers in STEM and be interested in the work that we do. But those conversations with parents... Uh, where they can tell us their knowledge of earth science, but also gives us an idea of what people are finding interesting from our, our data sets. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is evaluation. So T is going to come up, and we I've spoken a little bit about some ob observational um, evaluations, but T is going to talk a little bit more about quantified evaluations. Okay, so in the evaluations, there were two main methods that we use at the Canberra show and the Mildura show. So a few of you might have seen it. We've got this happy or not display is one of them. So it's very simple. People can put a ranking of four from very happy to very unhappy. It's just a portable tablet on a podium similar to this. We also had staff members such as Ian, you can see here filling out essentially a grid of behaviours that were observed by people coming in to visit our exhibit. So we had signs up letting people know that we were doing observations and it was a grid of these observations on how they were interacting with the displays, how long they stayed, did they look happy, did they look frustrated, did they call other members of their group over or did they revisit the display too? Like Margie said, we had kids that would just continually come back to the seismometer trying to beat their last earthquake. <laughs> we also had a few methods of evaluation that didn't quite work. So we had a proximity counter and there were some power bank issues with that. So hopefully next time we can actually get that. And that's an automatic counter of how many people we have visiting the display. And we also had the idea of doing a time lapse as another way to capture how many people would come and visit. But that essentially was, uh, that, that didn't pan out unfortunately. So those are our two main methods. So once you get all of that data, we're essentially left with a whole stack of pieces of paper, which is wonderful, but we did need a little bit of help actually inputting that into a little bit of a database for us. So of course that requires snacks to incentivize people <laughs> to help us out with that. Good snacks too. <laughs> so this is the first lot of data that we got from it. Um, so this is from the happy or not displays. And I just want to caveat, there's a little bit of bias that would come into these in terms of people are self-selecting to input this data. So you're usually going to get a pretty polarized group. People are either quite happy or quite unhappy with what you're doing. If you're pretty middle ground, you're like, yeah, that was cool, moving on to the show bag exhibits now. 
you might not stop and give that little one second feedback. So the top graph, I'll just walk you through it because I know it's a bit small on the screen, sorry. It's the it's a happy index is what they call it. The, so the percentage of people visiting that put each of those responses down. And then the bottom graph is the hourly distribution. And that was on average for the three days of both the Mildura and the Canberra show. So again, the percentage of happy index and the, on the x-axis is just the time. So notably between the Canberra show on the left and the Mildura show on the right, you get this dip in, in happy scores towards the middle afternoon. In the Canberra show, it's a little bit later, and I think that's because the city folk, maybe we wake up a bit later, so our blood sugars <laughs> drop a little bit later in the <laughs> afternoon post-lunch, but the Mildura show is a little bit earlier. But regardless, that's something that you probably need to be aware of when designing any outreach is maybe not put on your big display or your big activity immediately after lunch or in the middle of the afternoon. People are generally a little bit, a little bit less happy. <laughs> So I'm sure any parents would be, uh, be very aware of this called the witching hour. So then the other side of the data we got was from the observations of staff members watching groups come in and out. So on the left, we've got the Canberra show, on the right, the Mildura show. The Canberra show, we only had four of the Questacon tubs ready at that point. So only those four were evaluated by staff members. Whereas the Mildura show, we had six of them and we had activities being monitored as well, such as the seismometer, the plague tectonics puzzle, which I welcome you all to play with after this, and um, a fish tank aquifer, which the groundwater team very, very nicely let us borrow for that. So I'll just walk through this a little bit. So I know it's a little bit busy, but the main takeaways from this were the exhibits that had the biggest hands-on or creative component, people stuck around the longest with, and they looked the happiest with when they were playing with them. Another thing that Margie also touched on a little bit is the amount of words that we had on instructions. You can see most, the highest percentage we had was 35% of people reading the instructions for a tub. So that's something to note when doing these outreach activities is unless they are very self-paced or self-directed, you might want to actually engage with them and talk to them to describe its relevance to their life as well. So who came? We know if they were happy, what they engaged with, but who was it? It was mainly adults with at least a child under, year, um, under 10 years old or like year four age. So that can be a little bit skewed by when we've got school groups coming, obviously. But that's, for both of those shows, only one of those days were on weekdays. So we still had two other days which weren't accounted for by school groups. So yeah, obviously agriculture shows a big target demographic of theirs is adults with at least a few kids. So that would bias the data a little bit there. The dwell time was something that I actually found quite interesting. And by dwell time, I just mean how long did each group stay at our exhibit? The Mildura show was just over nine minutes and the Canberra show was about five minutes, 45 seconds on average. So longer dwell time in Mildura, they were happier to stick around for longer. And we started to think of why was that? What did we do differently at Mildura compared to the Canberra show? And we had specific activities that were designed to, for lack of a better word, hold people's attention, <laughs> not hold them captive, just hold their attention. <laughs> Such as um, we had rock painting activities, which would have little kids like really enamored for five, 10 minutes as they created their own pet rock. And that gave us the chance to actually speak to the adults. So really get across the purpose of why we were there, really fitting in with the strategy of communicating our science. So it gave us the time to speak to parents and listen to what they were interested in. And they would then share their stories on a lived experience or something relevant to their life that was related to earth sciences. And then we could share how something that Geoscience Australia did might tie in with that. And so it was a great sharing experience with everybody. And the kids walked away with many pet rocks. <laughs> I had to recreate Bluey five times. So <laughs> perfected it by the end. One thing I will note, so when we compared this dwell data to other organizations such as Questacon, I'm sure a lot of people here and online have gone to their Awesome Earth exhibit, for example. That had a dwell time of 12 minutes and 29 seconds. Whereas their other galleries, such as the Water Gallery, had a dwell time of about six minutes. And they attributed that to activities that would happen at a certain time that people would stick around for. So something to incentivize them to just stay that little bit longer. 
So whilst we're not Questacon, we can still take that idea with them and be like, okay, we need to give them a reason to stay. If it's, you know, the kids are busy and they're happy and they're not eating sugar, fantastic. That can be the parents' incentive to stay. Yeah. Or do we hold a specific event at a specific time? So we did have that idea a little bit at Miljura Show, but because of the waves that people would come in, we didn't find that a useful thing to do. So then if you compare the two shows, the Mildura show and the Canberra show, to when they were facilitated by Geoscience Australia staff member, and by that I just mean, did one of us go up and talk to them and explain anything to them? Every group across every demographic stayed longer if a Geoscience Australia member was involved in their interaction with the exhibit. So if we're there and we're happy to talk to them, they will stick around longer, we can get across our message much clearer, and they can be left with a more positive interaction or a better understanding of who we are, what we do, and why it might be interesting to them. <clears throat> so as a quick little wrap up, the big things we learnt were, as Margie touched on, the placement of the tubs was really important to attract people in. <coughs> so which one we essentially advertised as pulling people in and grabbing their attention. The tubs that engage people the longest were the ones that involved some sort of hands-on aspect or a creativity aspect. So I'm sure you all saw the whiteboard out the front. Kids love to show us what was underground. We had some morbid responses. <laughs> we, we won't display those ones. Um, most of our audience were adults with young kids. So these tubs are fantastic ways to actually engage the kids and engage the adults too. Like, for example, I, I spoke to a man about 20 minutes about the, the cause going on there. It's a great way to just, you know, have that initial jump off point with people. Encouraging people to come in, Keith had a good analogy for this while we're at the Miltura show, that it felt like we were spruiking on Ligon Street, like we were standing out the front really going, hey, do you want to learn about this? And, you know, instead we're trying to give things from people instead of you know, trying to sell something. And people were really attracted by people. So if we were out the front welcoming people in, they were far more likely to come in than if they were just walking past like, oh, Geoscience Australia is here, and they keep moving. If you start that conversation with them, they'll come in. And they really loved sharing their stories. I heard so many holiday stories from people about that time they went to a volcano and they felt this or heard this, or the time they went out to the channel country and they saw the geomorphology. And they're really linking it with their own lives and really eager to share those stories. So, yeah, that's a little bit of a wrap up on the evaluations that we had. And I'll hand back to Keith to do a final wrap. Uh, thank you, Tia. Um, I'd just like to point out we weren't offering drinks when we were speaking. Uh, yes, it was, it was a, a bit like Ligon Street, but yeah, without the, the free bottle of wine if you're in before six. Um, so yes, to, to, to wrap things up a bit, so I think that what Tia was talking about, the stories are important, and uh, I just wanted to share one story as well. Um, you know, Margie mentioned the doomsday preppers, but one, one story that stuck in my mind was um, at the Canberra show that someone came up and asked about um, radon mapping. Um, you know, for those who don't know, radon is a natural radioactive gas and in, in sort of rare circumstances it can sort of accumulate um, in buildings to be a bit of a hazard. Um, and why the story was interesting is because it's, you know, it wasn't our data. Um, so we had to do a bit of thinking, we had to be a bit agile on our feet and um, um, had to Google, <laughs> to be honest. Um, and thankfully, Simon um, Van Der Wieland, who was sort of running the portal, sort of had a, a memory. It's like, oh, yeah, I've seen that somewhere. And he was able to piece it together. Just the act of helping was important. We could have just said, oh, that's not us, go away. Um, but, you know, even if we couldn't help there and then, the fact that we tried is important. Um, and as it turns out, the data is from ARPANSA, which is the Radiation Safety Agency for, for Australia. Um, and it, part of that importance of that part of the story is that people don't differentiate. Even though we've got Geoscience Australia written everywhere, um, we've also got the Australian um, coat of arms for the government. So people just say, well, you're government. And they often don't even differentiate between levels, you know, between state and territory <laughs> and federal. Um, and often some of those stories are about other parts of government, like the post office, for example, <laughs> from one memorable story I, I, I remember. Um, so there's, there's, and these things is there, need to be um, agile and aware. And it's also that those, those stories are telling us something. In this case, the radon story was telling us someone about 
their concern about their house, basically. Is my house safe? safe? A very fundamental concern. Um, so, you know, it's th those sort of stories that are, are telling us those things. So what's next in, in, in the way of wrapping all this up? Um, in the short term, we're, we're investigating options for, an, for another outreach event. So we're, we're, we're working with that and you know, obviously talking about timing, budget and resources um, uh, uh, with the people uh, who make the decisions about that. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that there may be another event that we can uh, talk about in, uh, in the near future. Um, but in the longer term, I wanted to conclude by saying, well, Exploring for the Future program has created this, this amazing capability for Geoscience Australia uh, for both future field work, and we talk about that more uh, another time, but also, as you've heard today, about outreach. Um, and it's not just that the physical resource of the trailer and all the tubs and things and um, those other handouts, um, which we'd, you're very welcome to come and have a look at, but it's also that growing body of knowledge that Geoscience Australia is accumulating about just how we do this as a craft and why it's important and you know, how we can improve and adapt um, all the time. And I think that's, that's very important. Um, so to conclude, we're sort of very happy to discuss ideas, how this capability can be woven into future projects. Um, and well, thank you for your time, um, everyone that's here and then online, and we're very happy to take questions or comments or even stories. Thank you very much. Thank you.